war mentality. It's a really interesting topic and it's something that has really stuck with me since I was a war reporter. Are all ethics off the table? And this is what I always say to people when they go, oh yeah, war, there's all these horrible things happening. I go, war is horrible, right? It's disgusting. Human beings at their most base, they're most violent. They're most free from law and order. And this is what happens, right? I spent two years in Bosnia watching society break down because there was no society. There were no police. There was no law and order. So ordinary people were becoming criminal. Some of the worst warlords in Bosnia, who I had the great misfortune of meeting, had been doctors, GPs, solicitors. They'd been what I would call normal upstanding members of society. And yet, as soon as the war happened, they became monsters. So why is that? It has puzzled me since the early 90s. So we're talking about that now with Sam uh, Vagnin, who's Professor of Clinical Psychology and uh, geopolit he's also a geopolitical analyst. Um, good to talk to you. Uh, this, this is, uh, uh, Sam, it's, it's an fa absolutely fascinating um, realm of psychology because, uh, like I was saying, I saw people who had been nurses and doc nice, you would imagine, people becoming some of the most violent, despotic war criminals that I've ever come across. Yes, indeed. War tends to transform people. I'm glad to be here and glad to meet you and thank you for having me. <laughs> Um, but first, let's dispense of a minority, of a certain minority in war. And these are the sadistic, narcissistic psychopaths. They tend to gravitate to war zones. And they tend to regard war as raw, as pure, as exhilarating and ex exalting, as an apotheosis of kind. They become godlike. And it's cathartic. There's a process of catharsis involved. This is people, these are people like Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse Now. Adolf Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf that the best four years of his life were the years of the First World War, where he served as a courier running among the trenches and nearly getting decimated time and again. And yet he said this was the best period of his life. So, but this, luckily for humanity, this is a small minority. All the others, are normal people, healthy people, functional people, who are being transmogrified by war. And I understand my mandate in this interview is to explain why and how, <laughs> as someone who, yes, who dabbles, <laughs> dabbles in psychology. By the way, I've experienced war. I'm an Israeli. I served in two wars. I've experienced war, war in uh, Sierra Leone. I've experienced war, wars elsewhere. So I have a first-hand experience with war, and I have been transformed by war. So I know, I know that this is a real process. I think um, there are two reasons for for these transformations or transmutations in 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 human beings who are exposed to the abnormal condition of war. War is abnormal. The first one is a set of reactions to bonding and intimacy. Now this sounds totally counterintuitive, but when you're in war, you tend to be intimate with your enemy. You witness your enemy's way of life, their families, their habitats, their villages and cities, their culture and society. You become intimate with the enemy. There is even a modicum of bonding. It's normal when people are exposed to each other. And this is perceived as life-threatening because you're not supposed to bond with the enemy. You're not supposed to be intimate with the enemy. So we activate psychological defenses. We objectify the enemy. We begin to consider the enemy the equivalent of an inanimate object. And we dehumanize the enemy. And we dehumanize the enemy using three defense mechanisms, psychological defense mechanisms. The first one is known as 
splitting. We are all good, the enemy is all bad, black and white thinking. The second defense mechanism is known as reaction formation. We attribute to the enemy those things in us, those traits and qualities and thoughts and emotions that we reject in ourselves. And this is known as a reaction formation. And then there's attribution error. Attribution error is when we say, we are the good guys because we choose to be the good guys. They are the bad guys because that's who they are. This is their essence. Now, all these psychological defense mechanisms in confluence, by the way, serve to dehumanize and objectify the enemy so as to prevent and forestall intimacy and bonding. Because intimacy and bonding is bad for the business of war, of course. The second group of defenses or group of psychological processes has to do with paranoid ideation, with the secretary delusions, or in short, has to do with fear. War is terrifying. War is disorienting. War is frightening. People have this image of war as a kind of war game. Like everyone knows where they're going. Everyone knows what they're doing. Everything is pre-planned and premeditated. And it's just a question of execution. Mm. That's not war. No. War is chaos. War is a blood, it's a mess. There's no way you can find yourself in war. It's extremely disorienting, terrifying. You're dislocated. It's exactly like being trapped in a nightmare. Mm. So there's a lot of paranoia, a lot of fear, a lot of terror, and there are defenses against it. And the defenses are self-empowerment. You empower yourself and you reassert control by abusing people by torturing people, by killing people unnecessarily, by traumatizing them, because then you are in control of your patch. Like, you can't control anything else. Yeah. You can't control the enemy. You can't control your own battalion or unit, but you can control the poor wretch you are torturing and killing. It's a form of reassertion of control. And you justify this by saying it's unnecessary self-defense or I'm doing this for the greater good. I'm a savior, I'm a rescuer. Or, or I'm just preempting an attack. It's preemptive and it reduces anxiety. Or I'm just obtaining closure and resolution. Or I'm being morally righteous. I'm the good guy on the side of good. And this, the enemy is evil and it's a morality play. But, but even if you know what you're doing, is not good right so you you we paint ourselves as as the the virtuous one um and we may find ourselves as you as you say torturing or, or killing how do we not recognize that that is bad even if we know that's bad right you don't walk up to somebody in the street and and start punching them in the face because you know that that's the wrong thing to do although you know you might be tempted on occasion but you know it's the wrong thing to do so there is there but so, so those boundaries get broken down then yes and that's because there is no ethical consensus no as to what is bad and what is good for example there's no ethical consensus regarding what constitutes a just war and what are acceptable civilian casualties? International conventions, international law, international courts, they accepted the reality of total war and the blurring of the lines between combatants and civilians. Even in international law, there is an acceptable level of collateral damage. There's an acceptable level of civilian casualties. And even in international law, you are allowed to attack a hospital or a school if it is used by combatants. So the lines are blurred. There's no clear, unambiguous, unequivocal guidance. And when you find yourself in a disorienting, abnormal situation, you tend to react abnormally to the situation by behaving abnormally, breaking norms and rules. And this process is known as anomy. It was first described by Emil Durkheim in the 19th century. Anomy means the breaking down of normative behavior. You no longer realize that what you're doing is wrong. You self-justify. You, you say, I'm, I'm, I'm actually on the side of good against evil. It's a medieval morality play. I'm on the side of God. Even the Wehrmacht, 
the German army, which collaborated very closely with the SS, even they had the, the slogan was, Gott mit uns, God is with us. So it was it was kind of carved on the on the daggers and the, that used to kill Jews. But God that's what I was going to say because there is that it, that that um, mentality is contagious, right? It's it's group think. So yes. if you have a, I've always, also I've always been fascinated with the way that crowds work and how they they tend to swarm like they've got one brain. But it's the same, isn't it, with the psychology of war? Is that you get this this infection, if you like, as to, well, he or she thinks this is okay, so it, it must be okay, therefore I'm not going to say it's wrong. Indeed, a, a very pertinent point. Um, the hive mind. Yeah. The hive mind, it's a colony. In war we become like ants or like bees. We are mindless. Mm. We All the normative inhibitions all the do's and don'ts, everything we've been socialized to not do or to do, everything we've been educated on, conditioned, everything goes away, vanishes, because a kind of super mind takes over, yeah. like a colony or a hive. That's one thing. And second thing, you're right, there is contagion. Um, people derive justification and de develop disinhibition. In other words, they behave in ways they wouldn't otherwise have behaved by observing other people. Yeah. This is known as social learning theory, modeling. We model our behavior on the behavior of others. And then it's simply an opinion poll. It's statistics. Yeah. If you're a member of a unit, 90% of which are abusing, torturing, and killing people, you would tend to torture, abuse, and kill people, just in order to belong, to conform. Because if you're an outcast in war, you're a dead soldier. Yeah. You need your unit to have your back. The the other thing that I just wanted to to say because, and this is going to make oh, well, it won't sound strange to you, but but when I was out in in Bosnia and Somalia and places like that, you talked earlier about the bonding, and there was a certain bonding within the soldiers that I was working with. I was embedded before embedded was really invented. I I don't think I've ever had quite so much fun. And, and people don't get that, that actually going out every day into dangerous situations with a group of guys that we, we'd become bonded, we laughed a lot, we, um, uh, you know, came back at the end of the day having not died, so you felt the adrenaline rush. It was exhilarating, and, and a lot of people are going to think that I'm mad for saying that, but it's not something that people talk about. It's exhilarating. Actually, that's how I opened my statement. I said that many people find it exhilarating, a cathartic experience, yeah. kind of catharsis. And yes, the bonding, the bonding is existential. You bond with these people, not necessarily because you have a lot in, in common, no. but you bond with these people because they have your back. Mm. They, they guarantee your survival. They share your values, apparently. They're the good guys, so you want to belong to the good guys, and that's so on and so forth. There's a lot... There are many incentives, psychological incentives, to conform. Conformity is a major power in war. And not only in war, by the way, in abnormal situations, for example, in financial crisis. Conformity, herd, herd mentality. Mm. We saw this during the COVID crisis. These people lose their minds. They, they lose their personal autonomy, independent thinking, critical so thinking, true. and so on and so forth. Yeah. When they're exposed to exigencies of abnormal, an abnormality of, behavior, of, of situations and circumstances. Just before I let you go, Sam, a lot of people will be listening to this and going, yeah, I don't care what happened to me, I would never become one of those people. And it's always a question that I've asked, having been out in places where there was that sort of danger and seeing people eking out their private uh, criminality, if you like, nothing to do with the war, is would I become the people that I'm judging? And I tend to think I probably would. I think that's a bit of a pessimistic view. I think if you have strong inbuilt moral, moral restraints, inhibitions, and a good sense of what is right and what is wrong, I think you would be able to resist peer pressure, um, circumstances of war, which are, you know, demanding or challenging. 
and you will be able to see the human side of the enemy without bonding or developing intimacy, which are inappropriate in war. Yeah. They're life-threatening. I think you would still be able to do this. Uh, listen, I think we are a bit, um, I'm, I'm not criticizing you or me, <laughs> but I think we do tend to overemphasize the war crimes aspect of war because it's good, it's good news, you know, it's good reporting, it's good media, it's good everything. But war is ugly. This is what I always say. It isn't good guys on one side, bad guys on the other. It's ugly. As you said, it's chaotic. You know, yeah. the, the whole, oh, collateral damage, civilians are being killed. Like, what do you think happens in a war? I, yes, I, exactly. I, I get very um, annoyed that people see this clean version or believe exactly. it to be clean. Well, it's exactly like, what I'm trying to say. Hmm. It's, it's, um, it's shades of grey. And I think the vast majority of people who participate in war as soldiers do not commit war crimes. Mm. I mean, I don't no, think that's a fact. I don't believe that. Yeah. That's simply the fact. Yeah. They don't commit war crimes. And let it be clear, every soldier in every war has the potential, the capacity and the opportunity to commit war crimes. So not committing war crimes is a choice. It's an individual choice in the face of overwhelming pressures to commit war crimes. And I think that's an optimistic statement about this, the, about mankind. I think that's brilliant. I think that's a good place to end it as well. Sam, it's been fascinating to talk to you. I hope I get the chance to do that again. Uh, Sam Vagnin, who is a professor of clinical psychology and a geopolitical analyst. Right, stay where you are. We're going to be talking about being child.